So Google's Gemini 1.5 is being described by all and sundry as a fiasco. People are calling for Pichai to resign. Don't think that's happening. And in general, there's continued uproar in the world of generative AI. Here's the bottom line. Absolute, for real, bottom line in the entire situation. First of all, generative AI is not real AI. The mistakes, so-called, that we're seeing are absolutely to be expected given the underlying algorithm. There is a way out, which we'll discuss today, and I'm not even going to say wait until the end of this video for me to make this secret reveal. We'll get to it fairly early. Most importantly, the reason that you should stay to the end of this video, we want to talk about what this means for you. Are you going to be involved in not just generative AI, which is, I don't want to call it a passing fad or fancy, it's a half step. It's moving in the direction of the only exciting, realistically interesting topic, which is AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. And as soon as we scope out how it works properly, we can get a sense of how to get to where we really want to be. That's the important thing. And then for you, where do you want to position yourself with regard to the emerging world of AGI? Hello. If we haven't met yet, I'm Aliana Moren. I'm the founder and chief scientist with Themesis Incorporated, the founder of the Themesis Academy. And for the past almost a year, we've been talking about a precursor, a lead-in to a new form of neural network that I've been soft selling, just as like, oh, here's this interesting new thing, but I haven't been really positioning what it can do. And the truth is, and this is going to reference the last video that we just had, the truth is that it is going to be the powerful stepping stone, the bridge between signal level artificial intelligence and symbolic. So let's take a step back, look at these two things. First of all, generative AI with all of its glory and all of its warts and foibles. It's a beautiful invention. We are so not going to do algorithm shaming here. We are not going to like shake a finger and say bad algorithm or even bad company. No, it is what it is. It's doing a beautiful job for what it is. And all that it is, is probabilistic getting the next right thing again and again and again. And it's all Bayesian conditional probabilities. And no matter how many millions, billions, trillions even of connection weights you have, or how long you make that context window, that's all it is. It has no intelligence. It is a single level processing mechanism. We're going to go back to that really old distinction. This is hearkening back to the 1980s, even 1980s, 1990s, where people who were very invested in AI were making this point, and that is that there's such a thing as representation levels. Some early researchers, and I will link to them, I will create a, a content page, maybe it will be a blog post, I'll put down some useful links. So early work emphasized the notion of representation levels. This was very key in some of the early vision processing. The key distinction was signal level at the bottom, a syntactic level, which is largely being absorbed in the signal level processing. These We're not explicitly giving it the rules for constructing a sentence in English. It is learning it from the context of what tends to follow what. So the syntactic relationship level has been absorbed largely, but the symbol level is above and beyond. And what we're finding through repeated experiments, trial and error, just mentioning a couple of the recent, oh my God, I can't believe this happened type of thing. It's like Google's recent release of Gemini 1.5, and I'm sure they'll fix it. And by the time that you are watching this, it will be old news. But when asked to show a Nazi shoulder, it showed a person of color. Well, yay. Let's just get to the bottom of that one right away. It's running a signal processing algorithm. It essentially has a Ptolemaic view of the universe. Ptolemaic is the early view where it comes from the Aristotelian and even earlier times with the notion that everything revolved around the earth. It was an earth-centric system. And scientists who dared to differ were rather vilely persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church, Holy Mother Church, as we know her. 
Copernicus was the first to really promote the idea that we had a heliocentric universe. And then we had other great luminaries, Kepler, Galileo. I think that it was Galileo first, and then Kepler, who did the elliptical orbits. Here's what we've got out of that. Back when we were stuck in the Ptolemaic system, and it wasn't quite working, they were doing their very, very best to, to improve not only astrological, but astronomical predictions. That is, what would you observe and when? And they kept putting refinements, little corrections, and little basically curlicues on the system of the Ptolemaic, everything is going around the Earth kind of model. So what we've got right now in a Gemini 1.5 and in any other system that's out right now that is attempting to be responsive to the needs of society, let's just say it that way. Those are our current equivalent of making Ptolemaic corrections. We're adding little embellishments, little curlicues. We're strapping some rules onto the baseline system. And because the rules are mechanical, they don't really know what they're doing. They're just artificially enforcing certain things. We get really wonky results at times in Gemini 1.5. Show that when we see Gemini 1.6, I'm sure a lot of that will be eased out. So that's the inherent natural native limitation of what we've got. And it's not a bad thing. It's just this is the natural limitation of working with that kind of algorithm and trying to strap on rules to enforce certain behaviors. And it's artificial and it's hokey and it's, we can find multiple instances where the system cannot do what you and I would consider to be common sense reasoning. For example, there was a recent report that somebody tried to get one of these systems to identify which was larger, a Great Dane or a Mini Cooper. And the system was saying, well, the Great Dane is larger. Well. Okay, that's an introduction to how we're going to solve the problem. If you're going to compare Great Danes or any dogs to Mini Coopers or any cars, what you're doing is you're relying not just on common sense reasoning, but you're relying on ontologies, symbol level logic. Now here, let me just jump in and introduce what we know is Google's secret sauce. We know this. It's their secret weapon. It's the thing that when we get back to not just search, but knowledge. When we talk about who manages the greatest knowledge repository in the world, it's Google. Now, Microsoft is going to be the best personal assistant and corporate assistant and organizational assistant in many, many ways. There's no question. Microsoft's co-pilot will have its own very strong niche, and we will start using it from pre-kindergarten going on up until uh, the rest of our lives. No question. Google will own its own niche. Amazon, with its heavy investment in Anthropic, will own the niche of products, which are rather simply differentiated, and there'll be other niche specialties. So let's just get back to that whole notion of symbolic knowledge. That is what Google has, and it's what they do best. Google has spent well over a dozen years building their knowledge graph. And it wasn't just algorithms even pre-AI algorithms. It wasn't just data mining and putting things into slots artificially. They had people, many, many people. I don't have any knowledge of how many, and I'm going on reports that are years old. This isn't one of the things that's been discussed a lot lately, but Google invested heavily in its ability to create a knowledge model of the world that spanned everything. So in contrast to Amazon, which is going to be very product-based, Google is the world's knowledge base. That's a huge repository of knowledge to cover. The difficulty, the challenge for Google and any other entry into the true AGI era is simply this. Symbolic knowledge and signal knowledge have not yet met. And this has been the ongoing conflict, it's been the ongoing dichotomy in AI for 50 years. Ever since 1974, when we had the first energy-based neural networks and Paul Werbis introduced his backpropagation method, we had the introduction back then of the first useful neural networks. And then at the same time, we were also having symbolic logic systems being created at MIT and other places. And the two did not connect. And given that they did not connect and there has not been a useful mechanism for connecting them, we haven't had the breakthrough that gives us AGI. 
because these two realms have been separate. So what do we need? Well, obviously, we need to connect the two. Once we connect the symbolic and the signal level processing in a useful manner, we've got it. We've got the core breakthrough because there is an inherent richness of material already available at the symbolic level, and there's fabulous research done over the past decades on important things like reasoning under uncertainty, common sense reasoning, temporal reasoning, a truly important subject, one of the most important ones that that exists. The reasoning of beliefs about things, like so-and-so holds a belief about a thing. That needs to be expressed in the symbolic level as a belief structure, not just a run-on phrase of terms. So there's huge richness to be mined. Once we get the connection to work, we can mine it. We're going to have the breakthroughs. They will be so fast. So the great question is, what do we need to do to connect the two realms? If you'd be willing to go and take a look at that original paper by Vaswani and colleagues 2017, where they introduce attention is all you need, the foundational algorithm for this next generation, the transformer-based generation of generative AI. And if you read their intro comments, you'll see that they're referencing as precursor algorithms RNNs, recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, long short-term memory networks, and basically other mechanisms that deal with temporal processing of signal level information. That's our context. Useful starting point. The key thing to getting the next generation, to getting AGI to work, is that we need temporal continuity of ideas or signal tokens. The signal tokens that are presented over a temporal stream, we're picking them up, let's just pretend, one at a time. So it's signal, 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 signal. And we are correlating signal experiences, sometimes close to each other, sometimes, especially with a transformer, very far in the past. Sometimes to multiple experiences very far in the past. What we're doing here is trying to gather associations of tokens, because they're not really quite concepts, they're tokens, and bring them together in a temporally cohesive manner and in a simple transformer-based architecture that's really all we can do because we're not using them to ignite ontologies. But let's imagine that we have an ontology. Let's imagine that we have the key thing to getting a workable ontology, which is structure. So it's not just a set of classifications. And I know there are hierarchical clustering algorithms in this. There's hierarchical LDA. There there are various ways to induce hierarchy, okay? But what we're really talking about is the movement towards ontology, where ontologies are rich. Ontologies store in their given nodes, not only attributes for that nodes, but then you can create instances of specific occurrences of a given node. So for example, if we have an ontology about cars, then that differentiates into specific kinds of cars, and it may have the instance of your car, your car with when it was purchased, the repairs done on it, that kind of thing. Ontologies also have relationships between nodes for simplicity, because we need to start with something really, really simple and obvious for us, because we're going to do a lot of what I'm going to call Gedanken experiments, German for thought experiments, working things out in our heads, working things out in the back of an envelope, just little idea nuggets and sketches while we get our own juices rolling on this. What we want is the ability for a series of single level tokens to excite an ontological node at the lowest level. In other words, you're not going to excite a great big high level concept node right away. You're going to say, oh, I have an instance of such. So we're going to continue this at a later date. The fan noise from overhead, which I just can't control, was just getting too noisy. And so we're going to reshoot. And so please look for the next YouTube in the series on what it takes to make real AGI. We'll be talking about the actual mechanism for constructing a connection between the signal and the symbolic processing elements in an AGI system. Once again, this is Aliana Moren from Themesis. Please check out useful links in the description box below. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you and have a lovely day.